A long time before anyone really knew who I was, I made a video addressing the question of whether modern humans and Neanderthals um, were the same species. Um, and I stand by most of the points I made in that video, but now I'm, I'm sort of approaching some level of actual qualification in, in that kind of field. I thought I'd make um, another video re-addressing the question and re-addressing some things about Neanderthals and some misconceptions people have and some interesting things about them. Um, I've explained that how we differentiate species doesn't entirely depend on whether two populations can interbreed and produce fertile offspring, which is what a lot of people think is the only, um, the only real determining factor. So you have things like ring species, um, which um, quite a complicated concept, but I'll make a slide and sort of put it up just so you can read it if you don't know what they are, but you, you might well know what they are already. Um, we often see the relationships between um, hominin species shown something like um, this. But in reality, you know, this, this is a closer approximation of what, you know, what the actual situation was, and even that doesn't come anywhere near. Um, you know, the, the idea of a species, it, it, it's a, a semantic concept. It's us trying to apply categories to things that don't really have categories that sort of naturally occur. You know, there's there's a lot of complexity in determining what species are and what the difference between two species is, just as there's a lot of complexity in deciding what the difference between two languages is. Um, it's just that most species are quite discrete and distinct from each other, and, you know, we want to categorise them, but we can't necessarily always do that very easily. Um, to run through it quickly, one problem with the idea... Um, that they're the same species, is that modern humans and Neanderthals didn't necessarily make the best pairings, even though there was interbreeding and even though um, we were obviously a bit reproductively compatible. Um, so there's no Neanderthal mitochondrial DNA in modern humans, and mitochondrial DNA is the DNA that comes down the female line, so I get mine from my mother, she gets hers from her mother, and so on. So what this means is that all the Neanderthal DNA we have in us today is the result of um, a Neanderthal man mating with a modern human woman. Um, and we don't have any examples of people who are descended from the other way around. That doesn't mean the other way around didn't happen, and that doesn't mean the other way around couldn't produce offspring, but it, it, it has implications about the offspring. So it suggests either they were infertile um, or they had such severe developmental disabilities that their lineages don't survive today. Some people when they hear this um, thing about no DNA existing on the mitochondrial line suggest it might have been a cultural thing so it might have been something like um, you know in, in society back then people always went and lived with their mothers and the Neanderthal societies died out so the um, you know so all, all the hybrids of that kind uh, died with the Neanderthals. But that, you know, that doesn't really make sense because obviously there would have been a lot of cultural diversity, a huge amount of cultural diversity across the, the range that Neanderthals lived in and across the range that modern humans at the time lived in and where they overlapped. So, it, you know, you can't put the whole thing just down to a, um, a cultural difference between the two species because cultural differences exist between individual populations, not between species. Um, a big reason we do classify them as separate species, uh, or at least most researchers that I know of classify them as separate species, is because there are big an anatomical differences between humans and Neanderthals. Not so big that they're different genera, but there are you know noticeable differences between them. That you know Neanderthals, Neanderthals do fall within the the, the range of modern human morphology. So what that means is, um, you could have a human child born that happened to have the proportions of a Neanderthal, they'd look a bit weird, it would be unusual, but, you know, it could happen. Um, but there, there are key sort of consistent differences. So there are lots of differences in the skull, um, in the shape of the skull and the brain case and things like that. Um, and they also had shorter shins and forearms. Their rib cages were tapered in a very abrupt way, so they would have had very strange abdomens that were widest just above the navel, whereas our abdomens, most of us are, are narrowest above the navel at the waist. Um, 
they seem to have had a very different hunting strategy to modern humans. So there's really, there's no accepted evidence of them using projectiles, um, bows and arrows, atlatls, anything like that. They had spears, but it seems like they used them at close range, so they actually got near the animal and stabbed it. Um, and this results in a lot of things. So Neanderthals have similar patterns of injuries to rodeo bull riders, um, which is a piece of information that's thrown around a lot. Um, and they they've been you know they've been physically thrown around by these animals. They've been they've been at close quarters with them. Um, most adult Neanderthals, I think, show evidence of traumatic injuries and bones that have broken and healed and things like that. Um, their humeri, which are their upper arm bones, tend to have a lot more muscle attachments than modern human humeri, um, and they sometimes have a bowing in their humeri that's more obvious in one arm than the other, and that's usually in their right arm. So it's been suggested that this is the result of enormous musculature in the right arm um, as a result of them thrusting with spears, sort of stabbing the animal with spears, and reduced, well not reduced, but less musculature in the left arm because they're using that to guide the spear. Um, but there have been experimental studies that have shown that if a right-handed person uses a thrusting spear in that way, it's actually the left side, it's the guiding side that does most of the work. Um, now, I don't see why they couldn't have just been doing it the other way round to the way the experimenters were doing it, but um, I'm sure that's addressed in the paper somewhere. Um, but um, you know, it could easily just be that they were doing other manual tasks like some kind of scraping or woodworking or something like that that required them to do a lot more with their right arm than their left arm in before wanking choke. Ha 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 ha. There are certain things, obviously, that don't preserve in the fossil record, so um, hair colour and skin colour. There was a study in the late 2000, like 2007-ish, that suggested from genome analysis that they might have had pale skin and red hair. Um, but they were in Europe and Asia for 400,000 years, so they clearly didn't all have the same coloured skin, they, they didn't all have the same coloured hair. Um, I've seen a lot of people misunderstand the adaptation for pale skin thing, like it they misunderstand the fact that the adaptation for pale skin didn't appear in humans until the Mesolithic, um, or whenever it was, and therefore Neanderthals can't have had pale skin, but this comes from a misunderstanding of population genetics. Um, so that evidence that they're referring to says pale skin, the pale skin adaptation in modern Europeans must have popped up in the Mesolithic, or um, whenever it was, I'll, I'll put it on screen, so a long time after Neanderthals died out, but that doesn't mean Neanderthals couldn't have had a different adaptation that resulted in pale skin, you know, like it, do, it doesn't even mean that modern humans had never had pale skin before, it just means the specific adaptation that's responsible for giving modern Europeans pale skin hadn't happened yet. So I think at least some Neanderthals were bound to have had pale skin, some were bound to have had darker skin. Um, Another thing that comes up a fair bit is people over-extrapolating from the fact that humans and Neanderthals interbred. So we did, we did definitely interbreed, but that doesn't mean we were completely reproductively compatible. So I've, talked, so I've spoken about the mitochondrial DNA thing. What that says is, as I say, there are no examples of a Neanderthal woman and a modern human male um, mating and reproducing. It only happened the other way around. So um, the implications, I mean... The fact that there are no surviving cases of the other way around, you know, that have descendants today, it really does imply significant things because, you know, one person reproducing can give rise to a lot of people in very few generations and there would have been some survival with that, If, in my opinion, there would have been some survival of that lineage if, if it had happened, basically, or if it had happened without complication. Um, we don't know anything about the cultural context um, or the cultural contexts that this interbreeding happened in. So we don't know how modern humans and Neanderthals viewed each other. Um, I see no reason to think they wouldn't have just seen each other as people, but they might not have done. Um, a lot of people suggest rape or some kind of weird prisoner of war situation, um, but I, don't, I think that's a ridiculous extrapolation. Like, I mean, it's possible, but... Um, I don't think that can really be gleaned from, from the evidence that we've got. I think it's, it's, you know, you can envision loads of perfectly normal um, cultural situations in which modern humans and Neanderthals might have just mated and it might have just been fine, 
um, the offspring might have just been accepted into society. Um, we, we really don't know, we can't speculate on the cultural context, or can, but we, we're likely to be wrong. Um, Another over-extrapolation people tend to make is that because we interbred with them, that means they must have disappeared because of that interbreeding. So that means we must have sort of absorbed their populations into ours. And that's another, you know, there's really no reason to think that the interbreeding was happening on that scale. It really doesn't have to have been happening that much um, in order to, to produce the results we see now. So I, I don't think there's any good evidence that we absorbed them. Um, that, that, that's another thing in evolutionary biology, um, is causality and causation, ideas of causation. Um, you know, what caused things to go extinct, what caused certain adaptations to appear. And it's a very complicated thing to unweave, because most things have a lot of factors going into them, and you really can't isolate any one as the reason, like, you know, the reason that Neanderthals, for example, went extinct. So, um... Uh, so people, you know, pop science articles will, will ask questions like did Neanderthals go extinct because they couldn't throw or did they go extinct because of climate change or did they go extinct because we killed them all? Um, and clearly some of these suggestions have more merit than others. So the idea that Neanderthals went extinct because of climate change is clearly more likely to have some merit than th that we killed them all in some big Neanderthal war. Um, but... It's, it's, I mean, it's difficult because the idea of the climate warming killing Neanderthals in and of itself is not really tenable because they were in Europe for 400,000 years through dozens of marine isotope stages. It would have gone from extremely cold to warmer than it is today multiple times and they, they were fine throughout most of that period. They coexisted with us for, I would say, at least 10,000 years in the same place. Um, you know, our ranges overlap for a very long time without them going extinct. So, I, I, I don't know, it's very complicated. I mean, something like a very abrupt instance of climate change might, could, you know, might easily have wiped them out if they were in a bad situation anyway, but it would have been a combination of factors. Um, and another thing is I think Neanderthals tended to focus on one or two main prey species. So if, if one prey species that they relied on went extinct in a particular area, that might have done a specific population in, but I really don't think that's enough to, to cause a species to go extinct on its own. Um, it would have been, yeah, it would have been a very complicated combination of lots and lots of factors, and it would have been different in different places, as is the case with a lot of things. Um, a few recent interesting developments are the discovery of a piece of three-ply twine that Neanderthals produced, um, and an interesting piece of art. I mean, examples of Neanderthal creativity and art and decoration have been found before, like feathers and things like that. But um, yeah, that's just that's a few of the more the more recent things that make it increasingly unlikely that Neanderthals were really that different from us culturally and, and intelligence wise. Um, so yes, thank you for watching this video on this fairly unusual topic. I've done a collaboration with the YouTuber Ecolinguist, if, you, um, if you've ever watched his videos before, which probably a lot of you have. Um, so I'll link that in the description and I'm, there's, a, there's a part two coming out um, in the next couple of weeks, next few weeks. Um, so that's that was fun, and thank you to Norbert for, for getting in touch about that, and I will see you all soon.